All righty. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Javier Gutierrez, and I'm the assistant director for the University of San Francisco's Sacramento branch campus. If you're in this session, then you're interested in our Master of Art in Counseling Psychology with that concentration in marriage family therapy, which is awesome. Throughout the duration of the session, we're going to be going over a little bit more about the Sacramento campus, what this MFT program is all about. We'll talk a little bit about financing and scholarships at the end of the session as well. And at the end, we'll give you all an opportunity to ask your questions, any questions that you have about the material that we cover, or maybe some questions about information that we didn't have a chance to, co to cover in the session. The primary way that we're going to be communicating during the session is using the chat feature that's at the bottom of your screen, or if you feel comfortably, or if you feel comfortable doing so, feeling free to unmute yourself and ask any questions as we go through. Um, the primary way that we're going to be communicating is as questions come up, let's go ahead and ask them in that moment as the question comes up. So if you need us to clarify something or go back in time a couple slides, and we go over something, let's go ahead and do that in the moment when we have those questions. So um, like I mentioned, using the chat feature or feeling free to unmute yourself and ask me questions right there. But without any further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. Throw this into full screen mode. <clears throat> And let's jump into it. Like I mentioned, if you're just joining us, my name is Javier Gutierrez. I'm the assistant director for the University of San Francisco's Sacramento branch campus. And this session is going to be all about the Master of Art in Counseling Psychology with a concentration in marriage family therapy and eligibility for the professional clinical counselor license as well. We'll talk about both of these degree paths and kind of what they mean for you as a prospective student. But before we talk about that, we always like to talk about University of San Francisco in general. Who are we? Well, we are a private university based out of San Francisco, California, back in the 1800s. And we focus on learning and giving back to our communities in the Jesuit Catholic tradition. We are a Jesuit Catholic private university. We have three core values that we focus on for all of our degree programs. The first is Cur Personalis, the idea that your mind, your body, and your spirit all, pay, all play an equal role in your success as a student here at USF. Two is we want to make sure that you're people for others. You'll see that a lot of our degree programs at USF focus on giving back to underserved communities. For example, in the MFT program, you might focus back on opening up your own private practice and giving back to your hometown communities. Our nursing program focuses on giving back to our veteran populations and veteran hospitals, so on and so forth. And the third is diversity. And when we're talking about diversity, we mean celebrating different races, ethnicities, religions, sexual orientations, genders, abilities and disabilities, occupations, socioeconomic backgrounds, the whole nine yards. For the Sacramento campus in particular, we've actually been housed here in Sacramento for the better part of the last 40 years. We do have a couple of other branch campuses in Santa Rosa, San Jose, and Orange County as well. All campuses have their own unique degree programs that they offer at that specific branch campus. But for Sacramento in particular, we've been here for the better part of the last 40 years. Inside of our downtown Sacramento location, we have a variety of different classroom spaces, lounge spaces, quiet study rooms, simulation and skills lab, and the collaboration zone, which is a large open spread out collaborative space that we have upstairs on the third floor of our building. Within the building, we also have a fitness facility that our students can use, 24-hour building security, and as a student, you will have Monday through Saturday access to the facilities on our campus. Um, like I mentioned, um, I do all the pre-admission advising for our programs, and I also do all of the campus tours for our program. So at the end of this session, I'm going to go ahead and leave my contact information. If you want to schedule a campus tour to come visit the campus in the future after this session, feel free to reach out to me directly, and we can coordinate that and set that up together as well. We don't just offer the, the Masters of Counseling Psychology here at the Sacramento campus. We offer three other programs. The only bachelor's degree that we offer here in Sacramento is the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and then three master's degrees. We offer the Master of Public Health. We offer the Masters of Counseling Psychology. And finally, we offer the Master of Teaching with that single or multiple subject teaching credential. So if you have any friends, family members, or colleagues who are interested in the world of nursing, public health, therapy like you are, or teaching, feel free to send them our way and we'd love to chat with them a little bit more about our program offerings as well. All righty. Let's talk about Sacramento Student Services. So um, one of the interesting parts about being at a branch campus is all of our offices are located at the main San Francisco location. So I'm talking offices like Career Services, 
counseling and psychological services, disabilities, ITS support, online tutoring, veteran affairs, the whole nine yards. A lot of these offices are located in San Francisco. So the primary way that our students utilize these resources is in a virtual manner. So online, via email, via text messaging systems, via phone calls, via online Zoom sessions. One of the cool things about being at the branch campus though, is we will host a resource fair every single year where we invite all of our San Francisco area partners to come visit the Sacramento campus for a day. So in that first semester of your program, you will have an opportunity to meet someone from the Career Services Center or Student Disability Services or the Financial Aid Office or the Veteran Affairs Center, whatever the case may be, you'll have a chance to meet them in that first semester of your program. So when they go back to San Francisco at the end of the day, you are now reaching out to Javier in the Financial Aid Office or Javier in the Disabilities Office and a particular person and a face that you can put to a specific department that you may need to utilize in the future as one of your resources. So that's one of the ways that we make sure that our students are well connected and networked in their first semester in the program and here at the Sacramento Branch Campus. We will also invite our university bookstore to come visit us during the resource fair. So you'll have an opportunity to buy a sweatshirt, a polo, a lanyard, a hat, a mug, whatever the case may be, they'll bring all of those swag items for you to purchase as well during that resource fair. Let's talk about marriage and family therapy in particular. Now, marriage family therapy is defined as any service performed with individuals, couples, or groups. You will find in this program and by doing more research about a bunch of different programs, Family, marriage family therapy is focused primarily on folks and their interpersonal relationships with other people in their lives. So it's more of the social approach when it comes to working with your clients and your patients in the future as a therapist, which is awesome. There is also an option in this program to become a professional clinical counselor. Professional clinical counseling is a little bit different. It's still on the same level playing field of counseling psychology, but it's a little bit different. Professional clinical counseling is defined as the application of counseling interventions, psychotherapeutic techniques to identify and remediate cognitive, mental, and emotional issues. Now, that is a lot to say that there's a big difference between marriage family therapists and professional clinical counselors. Like we talked about, marriage family therapists, they'll focus on families and individuals with problems and their interpersonal, social, and relationship-based therapy for your clients. This includes depression, parent-child conflicts, self-esteem issues, substance abuse within the families. And oftentimes when our students graduate from the program with that MFT concentration, they're going in to open up their own private practice, working in school districts, sometimes government agencies, versus our professional clinical counselors, their students choosing the PCC route, almost take a step deeper into the world of mental, behavioral, and cognitive health. Of their, of their patients. So it's a step deeper into the world of counseling and psychology. They're trained to work with any individuals and any issue that impacts your client's mental health. Where they work, most oftentimes, our students will end up working in hospitals, health centers, government agencies, sometimes starting up their own private practice at the end of their time in the program as well. So a kind of, kind of couple different routes that you can take while coming in and earning your counseling psychology master's degree, which is awesome good to have options when you're going into a master's degree. If you don't know what route that you want to take quite yet, if you don't know if you want to work as an MFT or a PCC, that's okay. You don't need to make that decision really until your second year of the program, which we're going to talk about here in just a few moments and kind of what that second year looks like in the program. Some other quick highlights about the program. It is a cohort-based model. So Part of that cohort-based model helps you create relationships with your peers and your faculty members. Um, cohort-based model basically means that the same students that you get accepted with, those are the same students that are going to be in all of your classes going forward throughout your time in the MFT program. So you are all taking classes together, having the same professors, and eventually will be graduating together in three years once you are completed with the program. It's also something that I should mention. This is the three-year traditional track for the MFT program. So three years does come out to being a little bit under three years in the program, exactly eight semesters, including the summertime as part of the semester deal. So let's say, for example, you got started in a fall semester. You basically go fall, spring, and summer for eight consecutive semesters. So again, the three-year traditional route. We do have a two-year accelerated track 
that is only offered at the main San Francisco campus. So if you're more interested in getting your degree in that timely, more efficient manner, the two-year accelerated track might be a better fit for you. We only offer that in San Francisco, though, at the main campus. Some other program highlights about the Sacramento campus is instructors are practicing mental health clinicians, so folks that are already in the field that still have their MFT license or their PCC license. You'll have small class sizes, only about 20 students maximum for all of your classes. Now, 20 students maximum per class, but there will be about 40 students that are accepted every single year to the Sacramento MFT program. Of those 40 students, the program director, Carmen Pacheco, she'll actually split those students in half. So 20 students into cohort A and 20 students into cohort B. Those respective cohorts will be who you run through the program together with at the end of the day. This program does satisfy the California Board of Behavioral Health Sciences, the BBS educational requirements for you to earn your MFT license or your PCC license at the end of your time in the program. And classes are one night per week. So you will be assigned a specific day of the week and you will have classes with some Saturday classes sprinkled out throughout your time in the program. So that one day of the week, like I mentioned, is assigned to you once you're actually accepted into the program. Let's say, for example, you're assigned Tuesday classes starting at 4 p.m. Well, you'll always know that you're going to have that Tuesday night class at 4 p.m. for the duration of your time in the program. Little information about scheduling for the program. We talked about this a little bit on the last slide. This is a three-year traditional track. So you will take classes during the fall, the spring, and the summertime semesters with a designated one day of the week that you're taking night classes. Now, keep in mind the time period, right? 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. That is when you're going to be assigned to take classes here at the Sacramento campus that one day per week. So let's say, for example, it's Tuesday. For some other students, it might be a Thursday assignment, and you'll get that assignment once you're actually accepted into the program. You will have the occasional Saturday class, depending on the intensity of the semester. I like to tell students you're only going to have about five or six Saturday sessions per semester. Saturday classes are not nighttime classes. They're actually daytime classes from about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Students will most likely have more Saturday classes during the summertime semester because we jump from a 16-week traditional semester to a 12-week accelerated term during the summer. So naturally, there will be more Saturday classes during the summertime, something to be aware of as well. You will get a list of all of those Saturday commitments as you're registering for the next semester's classes. So if we're in the spring semester right now and you are all registering for summer classes sometime during the month of April, when you're registering, you are going to know exactly when those Saturday classes are going to take place. So you're aware of them and you're aware of that commitment as you're signing up for the next semester's classes. Your final two semesters, all students will shift to something called traineeship. Traineeship is an actual class that you'll take in the program. This will be on Fridays. So even if you had a Tuesday assignment or a Thursday assignment for classes, in that final two semesters, that final year of the program, all students are going to shift to Friday classes from 4.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Traineeship is almost more of a discussion and collaborative-based class that you're taking in your final year of the program. Oftentimes, students are not having any projects, homework, readings, or assignments for their traineeship class in their final year. It's almost more of a discussion and collaborative-based class because in that final year as well, you're also starting your field work experience, which we're going to talk about here in a few slides. So it's almost more as an opportunity to meet and connect with your cohort members, talk to your faculty advisor that you're having for that final year of the program, and talk about the experiences that you guys are having at your field work agency, things that are going well, things that are going wrong, clients that you're interacting with, other registered therapists that you're interacting with, all bringing those, uh, those experiences together during that traineeship class. So like I mentioned, that final year, Fridays starting at 4.30, ending at 8.30, it's less of an academic class, almost more as an opportunity for you to share your experiences and sharpen those tools for you guys as you move towards graduation.
classes are presented in a sequential format and allow students to take all courses together within the cohort. So this is actually how the cohort system is able to exist here at the Sacramento campus. Courses are in a sequential format. What that means is your classes are only going to be about five weeks long at a time. For example, the very first class that you're taking in the program is Psychology 631. That is Theories of Counseling and Psychotherapy. Theories of Counseling and Psychotherapy will take place from week one to week five of the semester. During that five week period, you're gonna be working on assignments, case studies, working on final projects, group presentation. Keep in mind, you're only meeting one time per week during that five week period. And in that fifth week of that class, you are turning in all of your final group papers, assignments, research essays, whatever it is that you're doing with that professor for that specific class, you're turning it in in week five of that particular class. And that's it for that particular class for that semester. Fast forward to week six of the semester, you are starting your next class for the next five week increment, which in this case would be psychology 634, ethical, legal, and professional issues for the next five week period. That is called sequential mannerings of classes. Now that sequential manner of classes, the program director, Carmen Pacheco, she does that for a couple of reasons. She does that one, so students, you guys don't need to neglect multiple master's degree courses at the same time. There may be some readings or some case studies or some outside projects that you need to work on. So in an effort to make sure that it's uh, manageable for our students to do all these master courses at the same time, or not at the same time, in the same semester, you'll only be focusing on one of these courses at a time for five weeks at a time, which is pretty awesome. The second reason why Carmen Pacheco does it like this is so students don't get overwhelmed with the material that you're actually covering in the class. Now, these first two semesters, you are going to be fine. This third and fourth semester start to get a little bit heavy for our students. Starting in the third semester, which is the summer number one, we start talking a lot about the individual and family systems, trauma and crisis counseling, family systems, relationships therapy, which is marriage therapy, group work, sexuality and gender, mental health. These are really heavy semesters for our students and require a lot of inflection and self-awareness about your own circumstances that you're bringing into the classroom. So in an effort to not overwhelm students with that material in the class, that's also part of the reason why classes are in that sequential format. So you're only gonna have to focus on one class at a time for five weeks at a time during a traditional 16 week semester, just like you may have had at a previous college or university. So if you've never taken classes like that before in the past, it will be a little bit of a learning adjustment because you're gonna feel like, I feel like I should be working on something. I feel like I should be working on more assignments or classes at a time, but no, it's that's the purpose of the program. We wanna make sure that you can lock in on one subject with one professor at a time. And that's gonna be the case throughout the entire duration of the program in total right here on the bottom right this is this will be about 60 credits worth of uh of classes that you are taking at the end of your time in the program we're going to talk about tuition and financial aid here in a few slides but do keep in mind it is 60 credits throughout the entire duration of the program last thing that i'll say on this slide is this final year right final year is traineeship the class that you're actually taking fridays 4.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. is traineeship class. The only academic class that you're taking in that final year of the program is your addictions counseling class. That is the only academic class that you're taking in that final year. Both traineeship semesters, traineeship one and traineeship two, are those discussion-based classes. So you're not having any homework, any case studies, any group assignments. It's almost more collaborative-based because you were doing that fieldwork experience in your final year as well. So this is a natural pausing point. We just went through a lot of information about the structuring, the schedule of the classes. What we haven't gone over yet is the field work experience, financial aid and tuition, and the application process. That'll actually be covered in the next few slides. But for the time being, does anybody have any questions about the material that we just covered in the session? Things about the course sequencing, the schedule of the program, what that looks like, program highlights. Does anybody have any questions about those items? Again, primary way that we're chatting is the chat feature at the bottom, or go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions.
Hi, I'm Kara. I just had a quick question. Awesome, um, Kara, go for it. I um I'm just curious, and this is probably impossible to answer, but is there sort of a <clears throat> just the first few, the first say semester per for those five weeks of coursework? Um is there a sense of like the number of hours that students usually take on the homework assignments or preparing for exams? I'm just thinking through because from my reading online, it seemed like it's feasible to do this program given the hours um, and carry a full-time job, which is necessary in my case. Um, so I, I just was curious if you had any insights on that. Yeah. And I actually just had a student ask me about that last week and something I talked to, you know, we have student staff here at the Sacramento campus and they are a part of the MFT program, which is awesome. Um, so I actually just talked with them last week and about what does the time commitment look like outside? of your designated mm -hmm. class, like about how long are you preparing, reading your lecture notes, your course assignments, preparing for a group presentation. The conversation is around three hours outside of class per week, which is a lot different than what it may have been like from your previous community mm -hmm. college or university. So only spending yeah. about three hours preparing for classes outside of the classroom. So that's about what you can expect. For this program, a lot of the learning takes place inside the classroom, which is why it's such a long six hour period. A lot mm -hmm. of the material that you're actually learning is going to take place inside the classroom. So you will still have assignments, case studies, group presentations that you may work on. So that might, you know, turn that three hours into more like six hours if you have a group presentation in a specific semester. So things like that is what to, is what you can be aware of, but around three hours is the designation I'm getting from current students in the MFT program. Okay, that's super helpful, thank you. And something that you also mentioned earlier uh, is about the working. You know, we have students that are working full-time or at least part-time while going through this program. Because it is that designated one day of the week, most students are able to fit their working schedule around that day of the week that they're having their classes. So I'd say the majority of students are working full-time or at least part-time while coming through the program. All of our master's degree programs, also in teaching and public health, are nighttime classes. So they're mm -hmm. catered around the working professional students. So we're kind mm -hmm. of tapping into a different population of students here in the Sacramento region. So if you are working full-time or part-time, it is very reasonable for you to keep those same hours while coming through the program. Okay, nice, thank you. I have a question right here in the chat. Can you comment on how many classes or days a week within the, with the, uh, can you comment on how many classes or days a week the two-year program differs? Yeah, that's a great question. I mentioned the two-year accelerated program is based out of the main San Francisco campus. The main San Francisco campus allows you more flexibility to choose morning, daytime, or nighttime classes for your MFT program. The tricky part about the San Francisco campus is it's not a cohort-based system. So you are registering for classes. You may have different students in all of your classes that you're ever going to take at the main San Francisco campus. So it's not a cohort-based system. It, it is a little bit trickier to build a good foundation or network at the main San Francisco campus. You are taking around the same amount of classes, but you're losing out on two semesters worth of coursework. So instead of taking three classes per semester, like you see here, you're more like taking four to five classes per semester at the main San Francisco campus. Kathy, if you do have any more questions about the main San Francisco campus, again, feel free to reach out to me. I will get you connected with the me equivalent from the main San Francisco campus. So they can talk to you a little bit more about that program and kind of how it differs. All righty. And I guess, <clears throat> sorry, I just have one more question. Go for it, yes. Um, just to triple confirm, these are in-person sessions at the campus yes. downtown. Yes. Okay. US Excellent. Staff, Thank you. Um, <laughs> we only offer one fully online program, and that's for the Master of Science in Nursing. Um, that's the only fully online program. Everything else is 100% in person at the campus that you are applying for, which is also something to note when you guys are filling out the application in the future. One of the very first questions that's going to ask you is what program are you applying for? To which you would answer counseling, psychology, marriage, family therapy. The second question it's going to ask you is what campus do you want to apply for? Do you want to apply for Santa Rosa, San Jose, Sacramento, or San Francisco? So it's going to give you four options. 
each one of those respective four options will take place at that respective campus within California. So do keep in mind, if you are planning on attending the Sacramento campus, you will need to explicitly note that on that question because that'll determine where your application gets sent to at the end of the day. So we are not part of the team that reviews applications for Santa Rosa, San Jose, or uh, or Maine, San Francisco. We only get the students that mark that they want Sacramento on their application. That's when it gets sent to us. And by us, I mean the program director, Carmen Pacheco and her team. Uh, another question right here in, in the chat, is the program in San Jose the same? Yeah, that's a great question. I believe it's the three-year traditional program also in San Jose. Um, Kathy, I'd recommend reaching out to me after the session so we can get you connected with folks in San Jose and then in San Francisco at the end of the day to figure out which program is the closest to you, which might fit your schedule the best. All righty. Let's talk about the field work experience. So before we talk about field work, I actually want to go back. In this final year, right, you are taking something called traineeship to class on Fridays from 4.30 to 8.30. That's a physical class that you're going to need to show up here at the Sacramento campus, less academic, more so discussion and collaborative based with your cohort members and your faculty advisor for that class. What's taking place in this final year as well is your field work experience. Field work experience goes by a lot of different names on the website. You may see the word field work experience. You also may see the word traineeship. You also might see the word practicum. Those are all the same thing. They're describing the same thing, which is your field work experience. That's how it's best explained in my opinion. Students will begin their field work placement search in year two of the program. A lot of these field work experiences will require an application and interview process in order to be accepted as a trainee at that field work experience. So really in year two of the program, you'll have some discussions with your faculty advisor and Carmen Pacheco, the program director, about what demographic or population that you wanna work with. If you know that you wanna go into school counseling, we'll look at some of the school districts in the Sacramento region. If you know that you wanna work with veterans, we'll look at some of the VA options that we have in the Sacramento region. If you know that you wanna work with geriatric communities or in rehab facilities or community mental and behavioral health centers, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different agencies in the Sacramento area. One of the cool ways that we'll make sure that you guys get connected with these resources is also by having a traineeship fair. This is separate than the resource fair that we talked about a little bit earlier. The traineeship fair is specifically for MFT students. We'll invite all of our Sacramento area partners to come visit the Sacramento campus for an evening. So you'll have an opportunity to meet individuals and representatives from social service agencies, behavioral health centers, clinics, school districts, rehab facilities, group homes, all within the greater Sacramento region. And you start talking with them about some of the opportunities that they have at that specific facility. And are they paid opportunities? Are they unpaid opportunities to start talking about the process to submitting an application for that agency? In this final year of the program, students must complete 425 hours worth of field work experience in that final year. That is a graduation requirement in order to get that MFT degree at the end of the day. That comes out to being anywhere from 10 to 20 hours per week in that final year of your program. 225 of those hours must be client contact hours where you're sitting face to face with a client, either in person via Zoom or via phone, depending on your agency, just like we're doing right now. Sometimes this also involves group counseling sessions as well. Students interested in the PCC, like we talked about, professional clinical counseling, must have 280 hours. So a little bit more hours required for the students trying to go into clinical counseling. There are supervision requirements as well. So for your first, I think, few hundred hours of, of uh, field work experience, you do need to be supervised by a university representative or an agency representative as well to sign off on those hours. Now, your field work experience, like I mentioned, we are going to have that traineeship fair. We're going to bring all these folks to you first. So you will have an opportunity to meet everybody from our partner agencies. There's also a possibility if you already work at an agency where you might be able to get client contact hours by your third year of the program. If you're currently working at an agency right now, there is the possibility to set up that partnership with the USF MFT program to track those hours right now 
at your current position or current location. That's something that we'll talk to you a little bit more about during the admission process, but that opportunity is also on the table as well. As far as licensing requirements, there are specific requirements for the state of California. These licensing requirements are gonna vary from state to state. So sometimes I get students that ask me, hey, if I graduate from this program here at USF Sacramento, will I be able to move to New Hampshire and become a therapist there? The answer is it depends on that state that you're moving towards. These requirements are gonna be unique to the state of California. If you already have an idea on a state that you might be looking to relocate to, I'd recommend getting connected with me to get connected with the program director. Carmen Pacheco, she, she can talk to you a little bit more about the transferring options of your license to see what that process might be like from state to state. So if that's the boat that you're in, I'd recommend reaching out, doing a little bit more research about these programs before you commit and apply. But if you're planning on staying in the state of California, which a good majority of you are, there are specific border requirements that you're gonna need to meet. The first is the completion of an MFT program. The second is the completion of 3,000 hours of field work experience. We talked about it on the last slide. During your time in the program, you're completing about 425 of these hours. In order to get your license in the state of California, you need 3,000 hours. So those 425 hours are going towards your California state requirements, but you'll still be responsible for about 2,500 hours post-graduation. Now, a lot of our students do get offered full-time positions with their own client and caseload before they even graduate, which is awesome. As long as you're working under somebody who's a licensed marriage family therapist or a licensed clinical counselor that can sign off on those hours at the end of the day, that is going to be the best case scenario for all of our students going in to that final year of the program. Like I mentioned, as long as you're working under somebody who can sign off on those hours, that is going to be the area that we're going to operate in. Typically, it takes students anywhere from one to three years post-graduation to complete these 3,000 hours in order to actually sit for the California state exam to get that MFT license. Like I mentioned in a couple earlier slides, a lot of our students are pursuing opening up their own private practice under their name. In order for you to do that, you need to get your MFT license in the state of California, and this is what the process looks like. Now, Professional clinical counseling, we talked about this, right? Professional clinical counseling is a step deeper into the world of mental and behavioral health of your clients. They have separate requirements. It's a separate exam that you take in order to get your clinical counseling license. Very similar, completion of an LPC graduate program, that is this program here at USF Sacramento. This is still an LPCC graduate program. And then field work experience. 280 hours minimum worth of practicum, which is great. You're completing 425 during your time in the program and 3,000 hours minimum of internship postgraduate experience. So those 425 hours that you're completing in the program, if you're trying to become a clinical counselor, those 425 hours will not count towards the overall 3,000. So it will take a little bit longer to earn your clinical counseling license in the state of California, as opposed to your marriage family therapy license in the state of California. So do keep that in mind, all right? We will help prepare you for the exams and make sure that you have a strong network as you guys near graduation and that you guys are aware of all of your options for exams approaching graduation. It's also part of the conversation that we talked about a little bit earlier. If you don't quite know which population that you wanna work with, either marriage family therapy or clinical counseling, that's okay. You don't need to know that right now. We will have conversations with you about it though in that second year of the program because that's really gonna determine what kind of field work agencies we're gonna be looking into for you, all right? Admission requirements. Now, pretty simple and straightforward admission requirements. I think one of the most simple processes in the greater Sacramento region. It will require an online application. A $55 application fee is associated, but for attending the information session today, all of you will be emailed an application fee waiver in exactly 24 hours from now, waiving the $55 application fee. So nobody should be paying the $55 application fee. If you guys are having trouble using the application fee waiver, that's when you can reach out to me and we'll make sure that we get that $55 waived from your application at the end of the day. 
This is a master's degree. So it's a master's of counseling psychology with a concentration in marriage family therapy. So a bachelor's degree is required. Psychology is preferred, but it is not required in order to be accepted into this program. Now, we'll have the traditional students that are psychology in their undergraduate degree. They're applying to this program and getting accepted. But then we'll have students who are communication studies, ethics. We had a student a couple of years ago was mechanical engineering. Well, I just got off the phone with a student earlier last week. She's been a plant scientist for the last 15 years trying to do a career change. So you will all see once you get accepted into the program, it's not just going to be a room full of 20 psychology majors that you're getting accepted with. It is going to be a wide range and variety of students from a variety of different academic backgrounds, professional backgrounds, different ages, races, ethnicities, economic backgrounds, the whole nine yards. And in my opinion, that makes for a better learning environment and conversational environment. There are going to be things that you're going to disagree on in the classroom. There are things that everybody's going to unanimously agree on in the classroom. But the purpose of, of admitting such a diverse applicant pool is to make those conversations more fruitful inside within the walls of the USF Sacramento campus. So that's also something to look forward to as well. Minimum GPA is a 2.75 or higher. Now, that is going to be your overall cumulative GPA. Since there's no course requirements like an intro to psychology or an upper division psych stats course we are looking at everything that appears on your undergraduate bachelor's degree including any community college that you might have completed as well we will ask you to upload unofficial copies of your transcripts from all of your colleges and your universities that you've attended so unofficial means if you have like a pdf copy or maybe even a photo scan copy of your transcripts right now great that's all we're going to need for the application admission process. Official transcripts, which are official transcripts directly from your college or university, will only be required if you're accepted into the program for fall 2024 or 2025, whichever semester it is that you're applying for. There will also be two letters of recommendation required within the application. Now, our letters of recommendation are a little bit unique. You are not uploading the letters yourself you are only uploading the contact information of your recommenders. So for example, let's say you are listing Javier Gutierrez as one of your letters of recommendation, which I am flattered. Thank you all for thinking of me. You will list Javier Gutierrez. You will list my contact information, including my phone number and my email. And once you list my information, I will automatically get an email from the USF School of Education saying, hey, Javier is applying to the USF MFT program in Sacramento and has listed you as a recommender. Please click here to upload your letter of recommendation on his behalf. So again, you're not uploading the letters yourself. You are only uploading the contact information for your recommender. So when you're thinking about who you want to list as your letter of recommendation, making sure that you are selecting someone who you trust to follow and submit that in a timely and efficient manner. We cannot review your application until we received both of your letters of recommendation. Now, pre-COVID times, these letters of recommendation needed to come from the world of academia. So previous advisors, previous program counselors, professors, deans, department chairs, things from academia. In a post-COVID world, we are a lot more flexible with who these letters of recommendation should come from. Most recently, I've seen students use pastors, priests, community mentors, previous supervisors, coworkers, anybody who can recommend you for graduate level work or has seen you in an opportunity where you're giving back or training individuals or in a leadership role or an opportunity, that's who these letters of recommendation should come from at the end of the day. So again, if that is from the world of academia, great. Go ahead and list their contact information. Let them know that they're going to get an email immediately once they list your contact information and making sure that you're selecting folks who can talk highly of you and recommend you for graduate level work. All right. Second to last item, a professional resume or CV, curriculum vitae, is required. So uploading it, making sure that your work experience, your volunteer experience, any trainings or accolades that you want us to be aware of, making sure that that's all up, up to date and good to go on your resume or CV. The last couple of items is a statement of intent. Now, I have a full page dedicated to the statement of intent, so we're actually going to skip over that for now, and we're going to come back for it. Last note, 
that I want to say on the slide. The GRE is not required for fall 2023. We haven't required the GRE in about two to three years now. I don't think the GRE is going to be making a comeback here at USF. So we don't do any standardized testing or graduate exams required for our, our graduate degree program. So if you have it right now, that's awesome. We are not going to use it for the admission process here at USF. All right. So it's just going to be these items that appear in front of you. Last thing that I'm going to mention about this slide, I actually don't have it on here because it's something that I just like to talk verbally about. Once they review your application, they will actually reach out to you and bring you in for an in-person interview with the program director, Carmen Pacheco. If all of your application materials check out, if they've already read your letters of recommendation, your statement of intent, you will be brought in for an interview. Now, Carmen Pacheco and the team, they will interview every single student that is accepted into this program, all right? It's gonna be a combination of formal and informal questions that they're asking you. They may be asking you about some things that were mentioned in your letter of recommendation, some work experience that they saw on your resume, some things that you mentioned in your statement of intent, all in an effort to get to know you a little bit more and what you bring to the program at the end of the day. It's also an opportunity for you to get to talk directly to the program director, Carmen Pacheco, who is a graduate of the USF MFT program. So she's been through the ringer. She's been through this program. She's returned back to the university to run the program now. So it's one of those things where you can use her as a resource for any questions that you may have in the future as well. Of those students, like I mentioned, all students that get accepted will have to do that interview with Carmen Pacheco. It's also to figure out what cohort that she's going to put you in as well, either cohort A into cohort B to make sure that those are well-balanced cohorts while going through the program as well. The statement of intent. The prompt will remain the same every single year. Artic articulate your knowledge and your interest in the field your connection to our social justice mission, and a rationale for wanting to attend the USF MFT program. Now, I, I talk with Carmen Pacheco a lot and kind of, you know, you know, students always ask like, where do I get started? Or how much should I include or not include in my statement of intent? Because this is one of the more important pieces of the application process. And she always gives me bullet points to get students started. The first is consider your interest for wanting to become a therapist or a counselor in the first place. Is there a professional connection? Is there a personal connection to the world of counseling and psychology? Being comfortable talking about that in the statement of intent is going to be critical for the application process. The second is reflecting on your professional and your academic journey and how it has led you to this particular point. Talking about things that may appear on your transcript. If you took a leave of absence, if there's a lot of Fs so Ds on your transcript talking about those and reframing those in a positive light, talking about the experience or the lesson that you learned from those semesters and what has changed now and how it has prepared you to come into this program. And then the last item is including any relevant experience you have in community mental health or working with underserved populations. The definition of underserved can mean a lot of different things. It could be underserved or underrepresented school communities in the area, helping out unhoused populations in the area, migrant workers in the area, working with survivors of domestic abuse, any wide range of underserved communities. Talking about that in your statement of intent is going to be critical as well. Also, something that I want you to include in the statement of intent if you already know the population that you want to work with, the population of the demographic, if you already know that you want to work with children, if you already know that you want to work with refugees or international folks, if you already know that you want to work with survivors of domestic assault, if you already know that you have a specific demographic or population in mind, please talk about that when you're writing your personal, or your, not your personal statement, your statement of intent. That is going to be something that's going to give you brownie points at the end of the day and knowing that, hey, Javier wrote about this, this, and this. We don't need to buy Javier into the idea of becoming a counselor or a therapist. He's already bought in. What we can do now is bring Javier in and we can sharpen his skills and teach him how to be the correct therapist or counselor in the eyes of University of San Francisco. So if you can talk about that in your statement of intent, all these things combined, I think you have a good shot of getting accepted into the program. Like I mentioned, it doesn't end here with the statement of intent. There is still that interview process, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit here on the next slide, actually.
which is the application process. Fall 2024 applications will be accepted until the cohorts are full around the beginning of June. The priority deadline is February 1st. Now, what does that mean, the priority deadline? The priority deadline means that's when Carmen Pacheco and the team are going to begin reviewing applications for fall 2024. That also means that that's when they're going to begin interviews for fall 2024. If you're able to get your application in on or before the February 1st deadline, you will likely be interviewed and admitted by the end of February, which is awesome. That also helps with financial aid, talking grants and scholarships from the university. You will be among some of the first folks that are going to be eligible for those grants and scholarships as they are available for fall 2024. Financial aid at a private university is different than at a public institution. In a nutshell, it is first come, first serve at private universities. So the sooner that you apply, the sooner you are admitted, and the better your financial aid package looks like at the end of the day for that first year in your program. So do keep that in mind, all right? Tuition and financial aid. The current tuition rate for the university is about $1,000. $1,275 per unit that you're taking, all right? It is a 60-unit program. So we get upwards of about 70000 at the end of three years during your time in the program. Now, this is still a master's degree program. So you are eligible for financial aid through the FAFSA application or the California DREAM Act application, all right, if you're an undocumented student. Now, most students will go in and apply to scholarship and grant opportunities as they become available as well. Things like the Community Mental Health Scholarship, different scholarships through the School of Education. Carmen Pacheco is very close to the School of Education team over in San Francisco. She, so she will let you guys know about scholarship opportunities as they become available. Also, the majority of students coming through the program will end up taking out loans to finance at least a portion of their degrees from the university. I don't know of any students that get $70,000 worth of grants and scholarships from the university. That would be incredible. The students that I interact with are really in the range of about five to $20,000 worth of scholarships and grants in total from the university. That still leaves a good chunk of change that most students are taking out loans to finance that final portion of their degree. So do keep that in mind. Everybody's financial aid package is gonna be different depending on when your application is received and when you are admitted. So like we talked about, the sooner you could apply, the better your financial aid package is gonna be sometime after February 1st. If you wanna get an inside look on what that financial aid package may look like, especially as a graduate student, I always recommend calling our financial aid office, letting them know your plans, your goals. Hey, I'm planning to apply to the Sacramento MFT program for fall 2024. What can I expect as far as grants, scholarships, loan opportunities? Do I need to pay for those before I graduate, after I graduate? Is there a grace period? It's best to have those conversations ironed out with the financial aid department. So when you do get accepted to the program, hopefully it is an easy decision on whether or not you're going to accept your admission into the program. So the financial aid office is awesome. Highly recommend reaching out to them just to get the financing conversation a little bit more ironed out before you're accepted into the program. And that really about does it for the slides and the session. So we do have about 10 minutes left in the session. I know we have some questions right here in the chat that we're going to attack right here in just a moment, but my contact information, it appears right here on the screen. Any questions that you guys may have about the USF MFT program, I want you to reach out to me directly. Any questions that I don't have the answer to, at that point, I'll, I'll transfer you over to Carmen Pacheco, the director of the program. She definitely knows a lot more folks than I do here at USF and has contacts with the team over at the San Francisco campus as well. So any questions that you have, feel free to get started with me. If I don't have the answer to the question, I probably know somebody here at USF that does have the answer to your question. So feel free to get started with me. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the questions that I have in the chat feature. If you guys have any questions, feel free to go ahead and throw them in the chat or when prompted to, we'll go ahead and have you unmute yourself and ask your questions as well. Um, first question that I have is field work experience just in the Sacramento area. That's a great question. No, um, the, the, 
the traineeship fair that we're going to host for you guys in your second year of the program are all going to be agencies within the greater Sacramento region. So like we talked about, you know, if you're working out of, I don't know, Monterey, California right now, which is about two and a half hours away from campus, and you're do, you're working at a field work agency in Monterey, and you want to use that agency to track your hours, we can set up that partnership between USF and that specific agency right now during the pre-admission process. So no, your field work agency does not need to be in the Sacramento region. It can be anywhere as long as it's approved by the USF MFT department, all right? Let's see, let's see. Um, is this one application for all the locations or is there separate ones? Yeah, it's all one singular application that you can find on our USF MFT webpage. But like we talked about, the second question it's asking you on the application is what campus location do you want, right? Do you want San Jose, Santa Rosa, Sacramento, or San Francisco? There are four options for campuses here in California. Can you clarify, each set of admission is two cohorts? Yes. So each set of admission will be two cohorts in total. 40 students will be accepted into the program out of around 100 applications every single year. Something I should also clarify, here in Sacramento, we only offer admission in the fall semester. We do not do a spring term or a summer term for admission purposes. So the next term you will be able to apply would be fall 2024. Beyond that, we actually jump to fall 2025. Let's see, let's see. If you are interested in both the marriage family therapy and the clinical counseling route, can you have the opportunity to gain both requirements needed or both, if, or do you have to choose one track specifically? That's a great question. If you are planning to work in both communities as a marriage family therapist and as a clinical counselor, you can do both of those while coming through the programs. You will not be taking any extra classes at the end of the day. However, you will need to meet the requirements for both exams at the end of your time in the program. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if you do need to do 3,000 hours each for each exam. That would be tough if you needed to do 6,000 hours in total. That's something, Dal, I can go ahead and reach out to you a little bit more after this session. If you can shoot me an email with uh, asking that question, I do know students are able to get both licenses in this program. I don't know if they need to combine their hours, though. Like they need to do 3,000 singular hours or if they need to double up and do 6,000 hours. Dal, go ahead and reach out to me after the session. We'll connect with Carmen Pacheco to clarify that question with her. <clears throat> to clarify, all the USF connections are within the greater Sacramento area. Yes, um, the connections that we're going to bring to you during the traineeship fair of your second year are only going to be facilities and agencies here in the Sacramento region. Every single campus will do a traineeship fair with resources in that greater region that the campus is at. So the traineeship fair here is only going to have Sacramento area partners, but you don't need to go with those Sacramento area partners. As long as you have a specific agency that gets approved by USF, you can do your field work hours wherever you need to. Can you talk a little bit more about the accreditation, such as the COAMP or the COCREP regarding the USF program? I read that some states prefer COCREP. In some cases, one would have to move out of state for some reason. Yes, USF, we are not COAMP or COCREP accredited. And it kind of goes on to what you were saying. A lot of programs, a lot of positions outside of the state of California will require you to have a program that is COAMP or COCREP accredited. If that is the case, if you want a specific job in a specific federal agency or a community agency that requires those accreditations, USF might not be the best fit for you. We are accredited through the Board of Behavioral Sciences, so you can be a licensed marriage family therapist and clinical counselor, cl clinical counselor within the state of California. Going outside the boundaries of the state of California, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So again, like we talked about, if that's the position that you find yourself in, if you know that you might want to leave the state of California in the future, I always recommend reaching out to me so we can get you connected with Carmen Pacheco in the future to kind of talk with her a little bit more about that process and what it might entail.
Can you speak more about the potential agreement between the current job and the field work hours? I work as a school psychologist and I'm curious if my current contact hours working with students can count as field work hours. Yes, that's a great question. Setting up that partnership between USF and your current place of occupation is possible. And it is something that we wanna get started as quickly as possible as soon as you know the time that you come in for an interview with Carmen Pacheco. So that is about the extent of what I know about that partnership process. That is all processed through Carmen Pacheco and her team. So Julia, when you do come in for the interview with Carmen Pacheco on campus, I want you to talk to her about your hours right now as a school psychologist and making her aware of that partnership process in the future. So when we do get into that first year of your program, they can get started with the approval and verification process of your current place of occupation. So when your third year comes by and you're still working at that agency, everything is a smooth transition and we start tracking those hours immediately in your third year of the program. Is the maximum hours in the program that you gain towards 3,000, uh, let me see, uh, 3,000 hours only or under, three, under 500? Can you gain more hours than that? Yeah, that's a great question. 425 hours is the minimum in order to graduate from the program. Students regularly exceed that number though. Students regularly exceed 425. 425 is the minimum amount of hours in order to graduate from the program. And like we talked about, for the state of California, you need 3,000 hours. So that takes students anywhere from one to three years post-graduation to complete those 3,000 hours. All righty. Does anybody have any other final questions that we can help answer for the greater good of the group? I know we're kind of inching up on two o'clock right here, so I want to be mindful of time. Um, any other final questions? All right. I think we'll go ahead and we'll call it right there. So like we talked about, folks, if you do have any other questions about the process, my name is Javier. I'm the assistant director for the campus. I do all the pre-admission advising for all of our academic programs here in Sacramento. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and get started with me. Anything that I don't have the answer to, I probably know somebody here at USF that does have the answer to that question. So feel free to get started with me with any of your questions going forward. We really hope to see your application for fall 2024. Like we mentioned, we're pretty early in the admission process right now. So if you're able to get your application in, the sooner you get that app in, the sooner you'll get accepted into the MFT program for fall 2024. We hope to see your application in the future. We hope to visit that you come visit the campus for a campus tour sometime in between then as well. And we hope to welcome you to the campus this upcoming August for fall 2024. I want to say thank you to everybody who attended the session today. A recording of the session will be posted on our YouTube page later on next week. In 24 hours, you'll get a link to that recording and that YouTube channel where it's going to be posted. If you have any questions until then, feel free to reach out to me. Go Dons, and we hope to see your application in the future. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.